um, Andrew to the stage to uh, talk about mud, I guess, and things that live in them. How exciting. I'd just like to start off with um, thanking Natalie for a welcome to country today. Um, as we go through this talk, we'll, um, there'll be opportunities to um, make comment about um, the sorts of um, things that the traditional owners left us with and what we've done with it. Um, I'm going to talk about the, uh, the background that we had with um, benthic invertebrate mapping and then uh, Andrew is going to discuss um, in more detail uh, the project that we undertook in 2018, uh, 2016. Ah, well, that works. That's the start. So, some background of who I am. Um, I've been coming up here for the past 20 or 30 years and, and people would be saying, you know, who is this guy? He pops in, he pops out, he flies in, we know he doesn't live here. What, what drives him? Why does he keep coming back? So um, I had a history with, uh, as a technical officer with Fisheries and Wildlife back in the early 70s. I worked for a fellow called Jim Lane who was a very astute young scientist. We trapped um, mist-netted shorebirds in uh, the Swan River. We um, welcomed Clive Minton to the Swan River in 1978 and he showed us how to catch shorebirds uh, with a cannon net, albeit a duck net, but we later uh, improved the design. And in 1981 I came to Roebuck Bay with uh, John Martindale and Clive Minton and we, uh, at the behest of the Royal Australian Ornithologists Union to uh, look at this incredible find of shorebirds on the shores of Roebuck Bay. And, get the right one, um, we progressed through catching waders and, uh, uh, on, on many occasions and it was clear that we needed uh, somewhere as a base instead of uh, camping on the edge of the cliffs as we did. So the Broom Bird Observatory was going to be integral to our future work. Um, working for Jim Lane with Fisheries and Wildlife, the um, uh, it was uh, it was a um, program of um, measuring salinity and and wetland habitat in the southwestern Yukon Division. And as a young kid, I walked out there in, uh, in in these lakes with my elder cousin, and he was a farmer, and he was a duck shooter. And I can recall in my experience as a ten-year-old walking through these pristine wetlands with live tea tree thickets and, and uh, clear water and sandy shores. And within my lifetime, um, those sort of things had changed. But if we were going to, um, just going back a bit, if we're going to um, look more clearly at um, the invertebrates of Roebuck Bay, then, and I think I've missed a slide here. Let's go back a bit then we were going to need some specialised equipment, one of which would be the um, hovercraft, which uh, was purchased with uh, funds from Lotteries Commission, as Helen MacArthur mentioned, and a decent wetland, a, a, a decent uh, lab that we could work in reasonable comfort with air conditioning and proper lighting and some benches for microscopes. Uh, what's going on here? This one. You want to go to the next slide? Or? All right. So yeah, hang on. Might, might be all right there, Shane. Um, having grown up through the wetland um, monitoring process, I I actually was part of the group that monitored monitored these uh, wetlands into oblivion almost, and uh, so we finished up with things like this. So that sort of thing, visiting that. Having go, this is Gundaring Lake, and it used to be a pristine wetland. And so, uh, I won't say I was traumatised by it, but it certainly influenced my thinking. And I thought that Roebuck Bay needed to, um, we needed to be careful how we were going to um, operate in, in Roebuck Bay and ensure that the, um, the bay remained uh, such a valuable wetland. So, 
the top photo here is, is the group of people that were here in 2016. And um, there's 45 people there. 15 of them didn't come from Broome. The rest were Broome people. And in particular, we were, we were blessed with the Yaru Rangers and, and locals who participated uh, in some form. You can see that age is no barrier. And, uh, and even that one, but um, we had people from all works, uh, forms of life and, uh, and work backgrounds. So Roebuck Bay stands alone as the world's richest known intertidal mudflat. Now that might seem to conflict with what Daddy, Danny just showed us with slides at Samangoon where he had this immense um, abundance of, of bivalves, but the diversity there is not as great as Roebuck Bay. And in fact, in shorebird terms, um, I consider Roebuck Bay and 80 Mile Beach contiguous, and together they have a greater biological diversity than the Waddensee with 41 taxa, Roebuck Bay's 433 taxa. The Bunk Dogwin on the coast of Africa is um, 111. Yukon, Kuskokum Delta, less than 20, but once again, an amazing abundance and probably greater abundance than than Roebuck Bay, but it's the biodiversity that we're talking about with Roebuck Bay. The Yellow Sea, um, I couldn't get a firm figure for that, but um, people that operate up there thought that less than 40 would be a reasonable figure. Um, I started off with a slide and I missed it, but the people that, that were important to this, and the, and the, the most important person in, in the scheme of things was Turnus Piersma. Um, in, there's, there's a photo somewhere, but I couldn't find it, Danny, of Danny Rogers and I standing on the edge of the lake in 90, of the bay in 1987 or 88 or something with a shovel and a soup strainer, contemplating how we were going to measure the complexity <coughs> of, the, of the things that live in the mud. So, and we struggled for um, six or eight years after that and uh, not having any clear idea of how to go about it until Turner Spearsman arrived with one of Clive's... Um, uh, waiter banding expeditions in 96 and we got together and Turnus needed a, uh, a link person in, 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 uh, in Broome, well Perth was close enough, certainly closer than Groningen and, um, and I needed somebody to show me what to do and uh, uh, how to go about it. The, uh, so 96 was a, con a, a, a getting together of, of the mines in 97 we, um, we mounted the first uh, benthic mapping project and the, uh, the northern shores of Roebuck Bay were covered at a 200 metre grid. Um, in, 90, in 2000, uh, well the red uh, um, typing is uh, where we did a benthic invertebrate mapping project. The black is um, the Monroe project which was monthly sampling at four sites at, uh, at Fall Point and, um, and uh, One Tree, which I'll show you in, in, uh, in another couple of slides. So every, every year right through to um, 2015, we have had um, volunteers or in more recent times, Yaru Rangers collecting samples. In the early days, up until 2005, those samples were processed and sent to the Netherlands and Petra de Gui. Um, did the identifications and she's reported up to 2005. Um, 2016 was an opportunity for us to um, put together all the data and, and bring it all together. So I've been through 2000, the, uh, the tracking 2000 that Danny's already referred to, 1999 was 80 Mile Beach, 2002 we did the whole of the bay and uh, 2006 we repeated uh, 97, 532 <coughs> sites. In 2013 uh, a couple of the Dutch people came with uh, a few locals, a small team and revisited the northern shores of Roebuck Bay. Um, some figures of, of note, you can see that, um, I won't go into them in any great detail, sampling sites at uh, Robim um, uh, in 97, 800. We went to King Sound because people back home told me that if anything happened to the bay, to Roebuck Bay, the shorebirds would simply go 
to uh, King Sound. There's a massive mud flat there, but quite clearly there were only 19 taxa because organisms had a lot of trouble dealing with the flush of fresh water in, in, the, in the wet and then dominated by the, by the seawater tides in the dry. So very few taxa, it's not, a, it's not an alternative. Uh, 80 Mile Beach, 932. In total, 5,425 samples of sites visited, 108,500 animals um, identified and measured and um, preserved. So this little group was um, in uh, 2016 and Angela Rosson undertook a biodiversity education scheme and it was good to see that school kids were getting involved in that sort of thing. I'm going to rush through these slides now. A lot of the stuff that, you, that, uh, that I've got now has already been dealt with other speakers. So you've seen the intertidal zone, um, very deep sediments here, firmer here, and coarse sand sediments here. Um, this is a photo of uh, the, the wastewater treatment plant and this is showing uh, the growth of Lingbia. In 2005 this overflowed and poured tons of uh, sewage into the bay and, and in my opinion it, it precipitated the growth of Lingbia, Lingbia majuscular which is a blue-green algae and um, it's been demonstrated, Sora has demonstrated that where Lingbia occurs in great patches, it reduces the biodiversity of the uh, intertidal mudflats. In, two, in 2002, we covered these areas and we went right down here on a 400 metre grid through to Bush Point. 80 Mile Beach is a different kettle of fish altogether. You've got 223 kilometres of this sort of beach. Danny and Chris um, count shorebirds on the first 65 kilometres because that's where the most biodiverse part of the mudflats is. Um, the, uh, we we uh, divided the beach into blocks and these uh, we walked out at low tide collecting samples and measuring uh, the, the sediment softness. <coughs> so we extended from near Cape Nisisi down to 65 kilometres south of the Anaplanes turnoff. In Monroe, in Roebuck Bay, we had this um, monthly sampling with four point two sites there and two sites there, two sites here and two sites here. And about eight or ten years ago, we, we merged these two sites because people had a little bit of trouble walking out into the soft sediments. So there's some figures there showing that we've collected up to 2005 to 29,000 um, animals at 144 taxa. This is a, a shot of a site like Fall Point, so you can see the, um, the, the sandy sediments here which are quite different to the um, sediments in One Tree where this group is preparing to walk out into the softer sediments at One Tree and um, it was my role to stay on the shore and take the photos <laughs> and you can see why. But people often disregard young people's enthusiasm and Quite clearly, youth is not wasted on the young. <laughs> um, I just wanted to quickly talk for one more minute about Anadara granosa. Um, it's, um, it's a culturally important bivalve. It's the dominant shell that occurs in all the middens around the bay. Um, Hunter's Hill here is, is uh, littered with probably millions of shells. And in... Um, in 1997 there were 30 sites where we collected it, in 2002 it had declined to two and in 2006 it was still in, well it was starting to be, show a bit of recovery but really in 2016 it was still shown to um, be in decline. It's, uh, it's, well I've said that, size and abundance of the shell middens reflects this historical importance, excavations at Port Hedland revealed that an almost continuous sequence of archaeological sites starting between uh, 5,250 years ago to 50 years ago. And it was found at that time that the granosa replaced a mud whelp called Terebralia. Now in, um, in uh, 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 particularly in Weeper, but I've, at places where I travel I ask the locals about Anadara granosa and they all 
complain that they think the populations are declining. Where do we go from here in terms of mudflat work? We would like to get an atlas of the benthic invertebrates of northwestern Australia. This man is the key, Mark Lavalle from the Netherlands Institute for Sea Research. Um, we would like to establish monitoring at Roebuck Bay and DBCA is now working with Andrew Storey to um, develop a monitoring program. These guys are, uh, will be crucial in that monitoring program. With this sort of vessel they can do, um, do the necessary monitoring quite easily. And um, oh, is that upside? You thought it was. You thought it was upside down. That the previous hovercraft is no longer with us, but um, this is the sort of thing that we'll need in the future. There's a lot of ac acknowledgements here, and um, I haven't got time to go through them all. Clearly, um, the volunteers have been important. The Netherlands team has been important. The new wave of Andrew Story and his wetland research management team is going to be very important. Jane Prince from UWA has played a very important role and Yaru Rangers, Candy Carr and the Roebuck Bay Working Group, Chris Hassel with their, um, their um, public presence and their constantly fighting for Roebuck Bay is important and um, there's other acknowledgements here that um, um, we won't um, spend much more time on. Turner Spearsma. He will be important and, he's, uh, and we have to acknowledge his contribution over the past 20 odd years. Andrew Storey, you'll hear from him in a moment and I'm sorry you'll probably have to put up with him, he's a pretty boring sort of a speaker. <laughs> um, now, I believe cleanliness is next to godliness and if you're out there and you can see a broom, get out there and give it a good clean um, and it will make Chris a lot more happy. And uh, as Piersma said, don't take it for granted, 16 minutes, you've got 10 to go. <laughs> It'd only take eight minutes. <laughs> I'm not sure what time scale is working on. Uh, I thought we'd go straight on to my presentation and then have questions for both of us at the end. <coughs> um, let's get this up. So, part two, or uh, as I say, you've uh, heard Huey now, here's Dewey. Um, and uh, those are the those are the only birds you're going to get any semblance of a picture of in this talk. I'm afraid there's one about benthic fauna. Okay, Grant's mentioned the series of surveys that have been done of the uh, the, the whole of Roebuck Bay uh, from '97 right through to uh, the latest one in 2016. People have looked at changes in the distribution of certain species over time. Uh, by looking at plots in one survey and the plot of the same species in the next survey, tended to be of those species that are important to the diet of waders. But nobody has done a comprehensive survey uh, analysis of all the data. Try that one there. Okay. There's been no detailed analysis of all the data that have been collected across the whole of the bay and all of the surveys. So we really have minimal understanding of the spatial and temporal changes in the benthic fauna in the bay. And you need to understand that to be able to manage the bay for the food source for the shorebirds. And the absence of a database has been a major feature that's prevented us from doing those analyses. So we're very fortunate that through um, DBCA and funding they received from BHP, that we were able to instigate a program allowed us to resample the bay and Roebuck Bay and 80 Mile Beach in uh, 2016. We were able to compile all the historical data into one database so we could actually pull it all together. Just uh, changing the format there. Okay. Um, we could do in-depth analysis of the data to look at the spatial and temporal changes of the fauna, both in Roebuck Bay and 80 Mile Beach. I'll keep going. Yeah. Um, and then try and design a monitoring program to monitor changes in health over time. As we've seen from Danny's talk, we are seeing significant declines in bird populations. This seems to be attributed to what's going on in, particularly in China. Uh, Almost there. Okay, I'll keep talking. Um, <coughs> but we need to show that there's no change in the condition of our wetlands to prove that it's not us, not Australia that's affecting these important bird populations. Should be this one. It's not working. I do need reason. to slide now. Okay. That's your notes. 
We'll give you extra minutes for this. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Might just have Yeah, okay. Are your notes? Yeah, I might just close it again. Is that alright? Yeah. It's just got, it's done the reverse. Alright, let's get back to where we are. So in this presentation I'm going to talk about these last two points, the three and four. So looking at spatial and temporal changes in the, the benthos, the animals living in the mud, and also the preliminary work we've done in designing the monitoring program. Uh, before I get into it, and sorry, there is going to be some statistics in this, but hopefully I'll uh, keep you with me, I want to talk about the methods of it, because this actually has quite significance in how we're doing the analyses. So the main method we've used throughout all the surveys is a core. So it's a 100 millimeter diameter core, basically a bit of drain water pipe, which is pushed into the sediment at a maximum of 20, millimeter, or 20 centimetres. The core is retrieved, the contents of the core is put into a sieve, and then that contents is in the sieve is washed to remove all the fine silt and sediment, leaving the animals behind. At each location, we collect three cores from within a small area, within sort of five or ten metres. Okay? Those three cores are all put into the one sieve combined, and that's what your one sample is. The animals are then live picked, so from the sieve they're put into a bag, taken back to the lab, they're live picked to keep them alive. They're then given to the scientists who are sitting in the lab, and every evening they're slaving away, identifying all these animals to the lowest taxonomic level we can. Some to species, some to family level, some to higher levels. At the same time as collecting the cores, we also have a field data sheet where we make recordings of observations around where each sample is collected. So things like how soft the sediment is, how much seagrass there is, and different types of seagrass. The presence of larger animals, some of the crabs and things that you don't catch in the cores. So we've got quite a comprehensive data set with each sample. And as has been mentioned by Grant, the sampling design is a 200 by 200 grid across the whole of the bay and similarly down at uh, 80 Mile Beach. So that means on a north-south trajectory we walk out on a transect and every 200 metres along that transect we stop and take a sample of three cores. We then move over 200 metres and start on the next transect, taking 200 metre cores and then all the way around the bay. So we have different teams out doing this all day, trying to co coordinate with the low tide so you can get as far down the beach as you can. So looking at the 2016 data that we collected, so the plot there shows you the, the bigger the bubble is the more species we found in each sample. And you can see there are patterns as you go across the bay of higher diversity and lower diversity. So particularly when you get around to the southern shores here where it's finer substrate, it seems to have less diversity of animals. So in Roebuck Bay in 2016 we collected 533 samples, a total of 328 taxa. So it is a very diverse system. 22 of those samples had no animals in them, which is surprising with that number of diversity. And the average number of taxa in a sample is only eight. And again, this got me thinking, well, that's quite low for such a diverse system. So I started looking at the data in more detail before we got into in-depth analyses. So this plot is showing you the number of samples that had different numbers of species. So that's the number of samples with zero species, then one species, two, three, all the way up. So what was quite revealing here is that 47% of the samples had five or less species in them. So again, that's quite a low diversity for such a diverse system. The analysis that we concentrate on is called multivariate. It looks at each sample compared to the other samples and how similar they are. And you work out the percentage similarity between every pair of samples. And that let, lets us work out how similar samples are out here to samples at the far end of the bay in terms of the number of animals and the types of animals they contain. So with a data set of 500 odd samples, there's 130,000 pairwise combinations you can look at, okay? And that's the core of the analysis we do. And we found that 55,000 of those sample comparisons had nothing in common with other samples. They all contain animals, but there's no animals in common. So this is a really high proportion of the data set had nothing in common with each other, which made it really hard to analyze. So we started looking at the area we sampled 
three cores give an area of 0 0.024 square meters. So, you know, looking at that sort of a surface area that was actually sampled and comparing that to some of the other projects in the world literature. And you're going up to 0.25 of a square metre, 0.1, 0.5, 0 0.5. People sampling much bigger areas of, of mudflat or benthos. And we started thinking, well, maybe our sampling unit's too small. Yes, we're getting lots of animals and lots of diversity, but it's not actually sampling the whole fauna at each location. So what we had to do for the analysis was start combining up samples. So where we have a sampling point, we'd combine it with the sample points either side of it. So you go out 200 metres, pull that sample in, go out 200, pull that in. And so your sampling unit was bigger, it became nine cores. We didn't go down the beach because we didn't want to combine areas through a different tidal range, we always went sideways. And when we analysed those data, so the same plot here at the bottom, we see you've got a much more spread of samples and numbers of species. So here it's very much weighted to a low number of species in each sample. The here we're going all the way up to um, 65, uh, 66 species uh, in a sample because you combine them, but the mean number of taxa is up to 21. And only 4% of our pairwise comparisons had nothing in common with another sample. So it makes it much easier for us to compare one sample to another. So that's one of the first analyses we had to do to try and get a, a data set we could make meaningful um, interpretation from. So we then did what we call an ordination. So this graph or the, a map, so it's showing the, the bay going from town beach all the way around to southern shores. Where you have a data point that's a similar colour to another, it shows it's got a similar assemblage of invertebrates in the mud. If it's a different colour, it's a different combination. So you can see you've got a progression going from here all the way around to the south. So you've got the red dots and the green and the blues, light blues fading through and you get more purples and more reds. So it's showing you have got a change in composition of the fauna. You've got different animals at one end of the bay going around to the other end of the bay. You've also got a gradient going up and down the bay and that's not unexpected. So high up in the tide where things are exposed for the majority of the time, they only get short periods when they've got water on them, you've got different animals than further down in the tide down here. We also wanted to see whether that was a significant change around the bay. Whether you actually say, well, this is predictable that you've got different fauna as you go, go further south towards the southern beaches. So we coded the data and then, again, each point that's different colour has a, a comparable fauna to ones of the same colour. And the, the points that are close together have similar fauna and points that are further away have different fauna. Okay, so you may not be familiar with this sort of plot. But the line going through here is basically a trajectory of distance. The blue points here are Town Beach and Dampier Creek just out here. And it goes all the way around here to get into the southern beaches and one tree over here. So it shows that you have got a significant, statistically significant change in the fauna as you go around the bay. So again, that's important to understand if you're going to design a monitoring program. So again, I know these are horrible plots for people who have never seen them before, but if you just think of each plot representing the fauna in a sample, samples that are close together have similar composition, and samples that are far apart have different composition. And we can put gradients of our environmental data through this. So these lines show a gradient of inundation. So samples up here have a high inundation, so they're low in the tide, compared to samples down here. And on this trajectory, we've got penetration. So samples down here have the deep soft sediments in the southern part of the bay, whereas all the samples up here tend to be <coughs> out here where it's firmer, and firmer sediment and sandy. When we actually look at the data for those parameters, you can see here, so this is inundation. It's, it's not rocket science. Up here, you've got um, high in the tide. Samples aren't inundated for very long. As you go down the tide, you get inundated for longer. And you can imagine animals that some animals don't like being dry, high and dry, other animals don't mind it, and other animals stay down in, the, in the, the low area. And that's affecting the animals we find. This is just a plot, again, showing the bay from Town Beach going all the way around of penetrability. So this is the softer sediments all the way down around here, and these are the harder, firmer sediments. It wasn't rocket science penetrability, it was basically how far we sank into the sediment whenever you were sampling. So here you're sinking in sort of 30, 40 centimetres, and here maybe it's a footprint you're leaving. 
using that same nasty plot, we can also see what species change in response to those parameters. So you've got high inundation, high seagrass cover up in this area, so these sites of high inundation, these sites of low inundation. These species prefer the high inundation, these species prefer the low inundation. And on this trajectory here, you've got penetrability. So species that are showing a, a trajectory going down here, like the soft sediments, as opposed to species up here. And again, when we plot this on a map of the bay, so just given a few species, so here's a, a, a bivalve, and you can see it's predominantly up high on the tidal range. You don't find it down here in the low area. And it tends to be over here in the firmer sediments. You're not finding it down here in the areas of soft sediment. Whereas in other species of bivalve, it's predominantly in the lower area of the tidal range. So it likes being wet more of the time. It can't survive up here in the higher areas. And a couple of polychaetes. So uh, the worms are in the sun. So again, here's a, a polychaete species, again, high up on the tidal range. And again, get a few of them in the softer sediment, predominantly over here in the, in the harder sediments. And the opposite for another species, you're finding it predominantly down here in the lower tidal range. So it likes being wet longer, more of the time. So again, it's important to understand these patterns in the fauna if you're going to try and monitor what's going on. Uh, we want to look at what happens if you don't identify everything down to species level, but come up to a higher level. Are you losing information? So again, the, this just represents the samples analysed at species level. If you analyse them at a higher family order level, you get a change. They shift over. The information, you're losing information by going in this direction. And then if you go to a higher level again, up to um, the class phyla level, again, there's a bigger shift. So what it's basically telling us as scientists is that if you start reducing the, the level of taxonomic resolution, so going from species to family to order to class, you start losing information. And that's going to influence how well you can detect changes in the bay. And the final analysis we're looking at is, if you're designing a monitoring program, how many samples do you need to collect to be able to detect a significant change. So if you're only collecting one or two samples, you might be very <coughs> proud of yourself, but if you can't actually detect change over time, you're wasting your time. So the statistical techniques we can use called power analysis lets us calculate the optimum number of samples to collect. So we used the Monrobe data that Grant talked about, because you've got lots of samples in a close area, to work out statistically how many samples you'd need. So four points, FP, the two stations A and B, if you only have six cores in a sample, so you need um, somewhere around 30 samples okay, at a location to take the 10% decline in species richness. If you increase the sampling unit a bit larger, going up to 12 or 18 cores in a sample, obviously it takes longer to collect, but then you're only needing maybe 20 or 15 samples at each location or at that location over time to detect loss of species. If you were happy with only detecting a 20% decline in species richness, then again, you need fewer samples again. So sorry, it's a little bit, bit technical, but something we need to understand when we design a, design a monitoring program. So in conclusion, what have we shown? Well, it looks like, unfortunately, the three sampling cores we collect at the moment for a sampling unit across the big surveys isn't adequate. It's not capturing the fauna adequately enough to do proper analysis on. Um, we see the significant change in composition going from Town Beach, Dampier Creek, going around to the southern shores of the lake, so, uh, the southern shores of, of the bay, so that's important to, need, to know. You need to consider parameters such as inundation, penetrability, and, and seagrass cover, so I didn't mention that in the plots, but seagrass cover influences where some animals are. So if you start sampling different areas with different inundation, you're going to get different fauna as a result of that. I've shown that the range of taxa show different responses to these parameters. So some are preferring high water areas, some prefer low water areas. Again, for a monitoring program, you need to know where you're sampling and where those animals are likely to occur. If you reduce the taxonomic resolution, you're going to lose information. We need to do more work on this to understand that more fully. But you may be able to pull back on taxonomic resolution, which costs less money, so you can process more samples for the same money. But you need to make sure you're retaining your information. And you need somewhere around 20 replicates in any one location. So if you want to monitor changes in Town Beach or Dampier Creek, you might have to sample 20 locations in that area to monitor over time to detect any significant changes. So we have some ongoing analyses. It's still a, a work in progress, this. We need to look at temporal variability across Roebuck Bay, because obviously we need to know how much it changes naturally or 
unnaturally given the Lingbia blooms. Uh, we need to do the same analysis on 80 Mile Beach because what we design here needs to be transferable to 80 Mile Beach to monitor that as well. Uh, we still need to compare the assemblages of the invertebrates between Ro Robert Bay and 80 Mile Beach, see how comparable they are, uh, and then come up with a, a final monitoring program that uh, DBCA in, in association with the rangers can implement and monitor the health of the bay over time. And uh, as with Ga Grant's presentation, there are so many people to thank who have had involvement in this project over such a long time. It's impossible to name them all, um, but just uh, some of the organisations and also the, the work we did in 2016 that's ongoing at the moment is um, all funded by BHP, so they're sort of the main person to thank at the moment. Thank you very much. Uh, any burning questions for Grant or Andrew before we break for morning tea? I was wondering about also the correlation because you uh, well you pull data from adjacent sites to figure out how things are working. Mm -hmm. So uh, how do you decide whether you take bigger samples of one place or whether you sample more spots? Um, well, we were able to use the particularly the Monrobe data to progressively increase sample size, and you don't have a spatial issue there because they're all collected quite close together. And you can plot variance and richness and parameters like that and see what's an optimum quadrat size to sample. But it is a payoff between the number of samples you can collect and the size of the sample. The problem with what we had to do with the, the BIMS data was combining adjacent sites, you've then got a 400 meter spatial issue incorporating your data, which is introducing variability. So it is a problem that's, that's well picked up. When we do the power analysis, I only use the Monrobe data because when you did it on the BIMS data, that 400 meter variable spatial issue was giving much higher variance in the data. So I think when we actually do a proper monitoring program and sample, say, a dozen cores within a small area, it'll be much tighter data, much better to use. But yeah, it's, it's, it's not a perfect data set to analyze. Yeah. All right, I'll leave it there. Mm. All right. Um, Thank you.